Okay then, it's uh, my very great pleasure to, tonight to introduce Professor Les Lancaster. Uh, I've known Les for many years and uh, he's of course Professor of Transpersonal Psychology at Liverpool John Moores University uh, where he co-founded the Consciousness and Transpersonal Psychology Unit which has uh, led a really powerful postgraduate programmes and tra trained many students over the last 15 years including uh, I'm grateful for him helping with some of my own Open University students who I was able to, uh, who had an interest in the transpersonal, I was able to send them on to Les and Mike. Uh, of course Mike Daniels has also played a, a, a vital role. They're the dynamic duo of Liverpool John Moores and a, a wonderful source of wisdom and erudition uh, for the development of the transpersonal in Britain. Though Les hasn't just confined himself to Liverpool John Moores, so that's been his main base. He's also honorary research fellow in the Centre of Jewish Studies at uh, Manchester University and is also part of the adjunct faculty at the Institute of Transpersonal Psychology in California. And of course he's currently president of the International Transpersonal Association and of course a past president of the section here. Uh, Les is a man of very wide erudition and scholarship, uh, right across psychology and religion, uh, a tremendous range of scholarship, cognitive psychology, transpersonal psychology, Jewish studies, Buddhism. I've, you would think that Les was, uh, had done nothing but spend his life in just one of those fields, hearing him talk about it, but uh, he, his scholarship spans many ages. He's one of the finest scholars I've known. But more importantly than that, he's also a man who, for me, embodies wisdom and compassion. And that combination makes him a, a truly fine person to know and someone I'm glad to call a friend. And I'm very looking, much looking forward to hearing you talk on Kabbalistic psychology, Les. Thank you very much. I'm always worried by these effusive introductions, you know, because it can only go downhill. There's two things I want to talk about, two objectives. One, this term, Kabbalistic psychology, what do I mean by that? Um, and the second, I want to spend some time considering our, our discipline, our subject, transpersonal psychology. What is its authority? What is the nature of it as a discipline? What's its legitimacy? What's its niche in the contemporary world? And... I'm aided and abetted by my... Uh, yes, that's right. Yes, yes. Uh, and if you get bored with me, we can always put her on. <laughs> um, and that, that point about looking into transpersonal psychology, um, then I'm using the Kabbalistic material to illustrate uh, what I mean by the authorization. Authorization there. Um, and, and I just a sort of little government health warning in here as well. Um, I'm not trying to sneak Kabbalah in by the back door. Um, I, I, many of you know me, and you know that I have a great interest in Jewish mysticism, Kabbalah, for many, many years. Um, uh, I often see at transpersonal conferences. Not, I'm not thinking so much of this, but I, I do travel around a bit. Um, Eurotas conferences, ITA conferences. I often find that we, we, we have a, a, our local guru trotted in. Um, it may be in Buddhism, it may be a Christian mystic, or whatever it is. And, and there's that sense in which the, uh, the, the person is pushing their own particular tradition. I think this is one of the problems. I mean, it can be a very valuable resource, but it sometimes can be a problem. And I want to talk about some of the problems with, temporary, with, with transpersonal psychology in the, in the, in the contemporary discipline. So... Although I have this title, Kabbalistic Psychology, I hope you will understand by the end that I'm using, I'm using the material in an illustrative kind of way. It's going to be a bit of a sandwich. I'll start with some Jewish material, some Kabbalistic material, then we'll get our teeth into the question about transpersonal psychology as a discipline, and then we'll move in, back into the Kabbalistic material. Kabbalah... I'm sure everyone knows, is the esoteric tradition associated with Judaism. It has rather a broader niche than that, especially given the way in which it entered into the, the, the wider world, um, largely in the period of the early Renaissance. In fact, I talked about that, I think, the last time I gave a lecture at this conference. Um, and so we find Kabbalah in the, in the occult, in the esoteric tradition, connected with alchemy, a whole range of areas. But 
I would suggest that at the, the core, the core of the Kabbalistic tradition is really concerned with ways of reading the Hebrew Scriptures. The term Hebrew Scriptures, really, I mean the, the, the Old Testament. Um, and, of course, Western religions are kind of founded there, so it's a much broader thing than, than just Judaism. The emphasis on ways of reading. It's a very important concept. Um, and actually, I think it links into some of the things that Ian McGilchrist was saying yesterday. And I was thinking about this. Really, I think there are four ways of reading. There's one way of reading. We all know this one. You've got a book. You buy the fireside. I don't know what's going on. And suddenly you, you realize you've gone through five pages and you don't know anything about what happened. So that's, we call, let's call that sleep reading. It happens. Um, then there is, I would call, passive reading. And passive reading is like you're reading a novel. You're taking it in, you're enjoying it or whatever, and you don't have to be too actively involved with it. The third, active reading. And I think this is very important academically. And I'd say the hallmark of active reading is that you're reading in order to interrelate what you're reading with your own maybe developing theory, your own schema. Uh, so it's kind of fitting things in. Um, fourth type of reading I call Kabbalistic reading. And uh, I'm not saying Kabbalah has a monopoly on this. It involves complex, codified ways of entering in to the intent of the text. Um, whether it's the intent of the text or something we're adding into it, that's another discussion. So by way of introduction, I'm going to start with a classic section from the Hebrew Bible. Uh, there was a time when everyone would know this story. Uh, these days, maybe not everyone knows the stories. This was from the book of Exodus. And the, the book of Exodus is essentially about a spiritual journey, a sacred journey. At the beginning, the hero, inverted commas, Moses, is given the task of bringing the children of Israel out from slavery to the promised land. Again, a symbolic spiritual journey. And this is the text. Uh, Moses was keeping the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, and it came to a mountain. Blah, blah. The angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I'll now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. How do we read a text like that? Well, in the Jewish tradition, we certainly have additional material. The Jewish tradition is rich with what we call midrash, which is the, the commentarial tradition which really gets deeply into language. And a little hint from that tradition here comes with the word, um, I will now turn aside. And this is Rabbi Yochanan in the Midrash. He says that this word in the Hebrew is written in a strange way. Um, it actually has an extra letter which is not needed. So he says, well, this really is telling us something. The extra letter in Hebrew is letter hey, which is like an H in English. It's a fifth letter of the, of the alphabet. And Rabbi Yochanan said, what it's telling us is that Moses took five steps. Is that really going to help us understand? Another commentator, uh, Nachmanides, makes the point that what it's alluding to is the way in which Moses purified his heart and mind in order to achieve a prophetic state. And we've got a lot more material relating to what that actually uh, means in, in practical sense, in terms of spiritual exercises. I want to suggest that uh, the five steps actually are symbolic. And, uh, and one of the issues I mean by Kabbalistic psychology is to look at this material in a contemporary sense. Um, so I'm interested in the tradition, in the rabbinic allusions. I think they can be very useful pointers for us. But then we've got to be in the 21st century, and that's where transpersonal psychology comes in. And I would say, when you read this more subtly, you see that it's not quite simple. I mean, everyone's heard of the burning bush, and this, this go, uh, there's fire, and so on. There are some very specific statements here. The first is that Moses has an experience. It's clearly a 
spiritual, mystical type of experience. The second is that he observes what's going on. It's not simply this bush is a fire, but there's something strange going on. I.e., it's a fire, but it's not being burnt or it's not being consumed. The point of observation is crucial. And this word we had before, he will turn aside, which I said is written in a strange way in the Hebrew, and the, the commentators pick up on that. That's really important. Moses is not satisfied to say, oh, wow, amazing thing going on here. He says, I need to look into this. That's the word, I will now turn aside. And uh, putting a modern word there, analysis. Following his analysis, that's when the revelation occurs. It doesn't happen before that. And again, there's many other commentaries which make the point that, that as it were, God only selects Moses because of the fact that he wanted to observe and analyse and look deeply into this. And then finally, very interesting, this statement about present, being present. You'll find this is like a a code word in the Bible. All the major biblical figures have their moment in which they answer the divine saying, I'm here. And it's a very interesting word in the Hebrew because it has a strange grammatical effect. The word which translates as here I am, it has the effect of translating or changing whatever comes after it into the present tense. So it doesn't quite work in English, but it's like you'd say, well, um, this word behold or hear comes, and then the rest comes as, a, as present participles. The, the good analogy, I think, is, is a, a cinematic device, you know, where a, a history is being recounted and the director kind of jumps and you're there in that situation, clearly alluding to this point about being present. In fact, what this really means is, is a state of responsibility and preparedness to act. And clearly that's what this story is all about, the, the, the Moses situation. So just briefly, um, how do we read a text? I just opened up that text in a way which I think is, is interesting in a psychological sense. Kabbalah is a way of reading. Kabbalah is very much about language. And that's one of the reasons why there's a connection with psychology. And when I use the word, or the term Kabbalistic psychology, I have in mind a kind of two-way relationship. I think there's a lot of psychological insights in the Kabbalah, as there are in other traditions, which we'll talk about shortly. But I also think, and this is the interesting point about the role of transpersonal psychology as a, as a, as a discipline, I think that it, it goes the other way around as well. The psychology can inform some of these ideas, as is here. I mean, I'm emphasizing experience, observation, analysis from an understanding of psychology. So there's a, something of a marriage going on here. So Kabbalah is a, a, a way of reading but it's also very much a way of practice. And again, just a little snippet. Um, in this story of Moses is being selected, as it were, again, quite famous, he's very humble and he says, well, you know, I'm not really up to this job. And, uh, and more he says, look, you, you are telling me to go to these people, the children of Israel, and tell them, it's okay, you know, we, we, we're coming out from slavery, we're going out into, the, they're not going to believe me. That's what he says. I mean, it's a good point. You know, if someone, co- someone comes in the door now and says, I've had the revelation. Come, come. Would we follow? <laughs> Where would we? <laughs> Maybe we'd make him a keynote lecturer. You never know. <laughs> so, so God says, no, it's okay. Well, I'll tell you what. If you've got that problem, I can solve the problem. I'm going to give you my name. Hmm? Is that an answer? And you go to these people and say, it's okay, I'm going to save you, and here's the name. There's something much deeper going on, and Kabbalah is very much about the names of God. The particular name that is given is the best translation, I'll try to put it here, becomingness reflected in being. Well, that's a bit of a mouthful. I mean, the, in the biblical translation, I am that I am, but actually that's inaccurate because it's in the future or the imperfect. So it's, it, it, it emphasizes becomingness. It's reflexive. Um, this is the Hebrew, ehyeh, ehyeh, ehyeh. You can hear it there. It's reflexive. I will be that which I will be. And again, through Kamala, there's a great emphasis on this. It's really a meditation. In fact, the word, the name ehyeh, 
it's, it's very difficult to, to put in pronunciation, it's simply the rising, the falling of the breath. Which is a reflexive movement in its own right. So the whole of this is, is, is the human, is the microcosm spanning the, the, the cosmos, and it's about this reflectivity. I've just put it here in the form of the, the, the central image of the Kabbalah, the, the, the tree of life, but I'm not going into that now. So this central message is, if, again, Ian, I think Ian McGildress referred to this in, in answering a question from me yesterday, this notion that there's a relationship, that we are co-creators, and even that God, as it were, depends on us, which is, in orthodox terms, almost heretical. Um, but the Kabbalists were very bold and daring and looked at the ways in which the human input actually is concerned with forming or formatting the divine, the Godhead. Okay, so much, that's the first part of the sandwich, yeah? So the middle part, transpersonal psychology as a discipline. Well, what do we do with this kind of material? Well, one thing we might do, let's say that I, there's a meditative practice here, which there is. Um, so I might say, well, I want to analyze, I want to experimentally look at that. I could, I could use brain imaging, I could uh, use some kind of cognitive study and so on. Fine, uh, that would be an interesting study. Is that transpersonal psychology? Well, increasingly I would say that kind of study and the, the whole opening up of mindfulness research epitomizes this, it's, it's not within transpersonal psychology. It's positive psychology. Or even it's just cognitive neuroscience. I mean, many cognitive neurosciences are interested in those states. So, in some ways, we might even think of ourselves as the victim of our own success. I mean, when transpersonal psychology was being birthed in the, in the 60s, uh, then ideas like spirituality or mindfulness, they were definitely off the radar for psychology. For various reasons, which I don't need to go into now, things have changed. And, and so these topics, which we might say are our, our topics, you know, well, let's, let's grab them, let's hold them, we're attached to them. <laughs> Those topics are no longer really within transpersonal psychology. Um, so it, it raises the question, what is the nature of our discipline? Um, and there's a little side comment on that I might say that there's something strange with a discipline which is what 50 years old and still trying to define itself um, you do find an inordinate amount of material raising these questions um, maybe we're not quite a science but we'll, we'll come to that. We'll come to that. Um, the other point I just want to bring in there is um, I alluded to, to earlier. I find, I suppose this is a slightly personal statement, but I find considerable dissatisfaction at a lot of things that, I, that, that go on in the name of transpersonal psychology. I know there was a discussion yesterday uh, in relation to the, the New Age, and uh, unfortunately I couldn't be the full, uh, there for the, the entire discussion. But I think there's some very interesting questions. And again, when I've been to these larger, larger scale conferences, where you, you, know, you have 500 people there, uh, there's a sort of show side to it. It's like a circus. And you have, you know, your, your big speakers. I'm thinking of one example, and no disrespect to him, um, Stan Groff, for example, who does attract a big audience. Um, and I have the sense that he's being placed in the role of a priest. Um, and is that what we want? And again, to think about his work, you know, holotropic states and, and the techniques of holotropic breath work. I think they're, they are some of the, um, amongst the, uh, the major techniques that transpersonal psychology has developed. And we, we use a lot of practices which are drawn from Buddhism, maybe Kabbalah, etc., etc. Holotropic breathwork is something that was born through the transpersonal movement. And yet, and yet, you know, 
the things that are done in the name of holotropic breathwork, and would I turn to that for the legitimacy of my discipline? Um, something like perinatal matrices, the, Groff's ideas about levels of the unconscious um, related to sort of pre-birth or birth experiences. Very interesting material. And I have my own views about it, and I think there's a lot, lot in that. But have we demonstrated? Have we demonstrated the reality of that in the eyes of the world? How would we do so? That's why I'm raising the question about transpersonal psychology as a discipline. Um, this that notion about, uh, uh, just to add, of course, this, uh, the notion that a transpersonal psychology is some kind of priest or guru figure, uh, that, uh, we, that's, that's been a problem with psychology, not just in transpersonal work. I think about psychoanalysis. I mean, it was, there was a priesthood. There's no question the way it worked. Um, and maybe we have to accept there's this delicate line between falling into a cult of a personality and bringing into being a new line of tradition. There is a delicate balance there. Um, the other thing, just again, slightly tangential, but just something to think about. There were I, the people who were responsible in the 60s for the forming of transpersonal psychology, they clearly had ideas in mind as to what the discipline should be. I'm not going to rehearse all that, but I'm sure many of us know the writings of, of Maslow, Sutich, and so on, and, uh, and Stan Groff himself, I mentioned. There is something, it seems to me, of a mismatch between those founding ideals and the reality you see in some of these large-scale endeavours, like I say, these large, you know, 500-plus type, type conferences. Is that a problem? That's an interesting question. In other words, if the reality on the ground in the 21st century is not as it was, let's say, in the 1960s, or not as it was intending to be, intended to be, should we say, well, you know, let's get rid of all these hangers-on and go back to that pristine moment, or do we say, no, this is what the world seems to want. This is what people want. They do want holotropic breath work. They do want the crystal, maybe, the crystal side of things, maybe. Um, but again, I come back to the question, what does that mean for, for our discipline? Well, when we talk about a discipline, we need to recognize three realms, three areas of work, the three pillars. The first is having a valid research path. Clearly, science is an example of a valid research path, but it's not the only. So we have, for example, textual analysis within... I mean, I to mention my connection with Jewish studies. So, of course, there's a scholarly study of Kabbalah. It's a growing field. And that study is based in textual analysis, historical analysis, and, and concerned with the development of different schools and, and cross-cultural influences and so on. Very, very important material. But it's not really about, would it be a good idea to use these practices? It's not about... Are these ideas that the Kabbalists talk about valid? Once you get into that question, you're more in theology, which I don't think we're about, or I think you're in psychology. In what sense are these practices valid? That's where psychology comes in. So that's, that's the first one about research path. The second area is the, um, the spiritual mystical material as a soteriological, as a, um, a transformational guide. So I can bring a Buddhist text or I can bring a Kabbalistic text and say, well, we're going to do this because it's a damn good thing to do. Uh, it is different from the first. Although both of those are subject to commentarial traditions, I think. And there's, so there's a kind of checking that goes on, although it might be a bit loose in our day. The third area is experience and the extent to which we um, fall back. No, that, maybe that's a bit too pejorative. We build on our experience. Experience has often been talked about as very central to transpersonal psychology. I think to move that forward, we need to recognize 
And there's a division. And I talked about this before, actually, in this conference. Transpersonal psychology has a face directed towards the, tra- the transformational. And it's akin, in that sense, to therapeutic psychology. But it also has a face directed to knowledge or, the, or, or models of the mind, like we, I, mean, I alluded to Stan Groff talking about perinatal m- matrices as part of a model of the mind. Obviously, these interact. But the point I want to make, and maybe this is a central point of, about our discipline, is that the authorization or the legitimacy is different in the two cases. So the three areas that I talked about come into both of these, science, um, the spiritual mystical teachings, and the role of experience. But crucially, I think, as far as the legitimacy is concerned, there is a difference. When it comes to understanding the nature of mind, I think science is a, is a very important guide. So I've got some background with neuroscience, for example, which is crucial. Cognitive science and other areas. I also think, and this is, again, uh, Martin mentioned some of my work in, in the area of Buddhism and looking at Buddhist texts and, and trying to extract what they're saying in relation to contemporary models of the mind in cognitive science. So there is this area where the spiritual mystical teachings certainly feed into our ability to model the mind. But experience is not our master there. On the other side, science doesn't feature too well. By and large, in the whole realm of psychoanalysis and therapeutic psychology, there is a paucity of literature, of research literature, which can say, yes, you know, you do this for three years and these are the outcomes. Um, and, And we all know that it's a bit like parapsychology in some ways. You know, we all know that, the, the, that there, is, there is something going on there. But it's notoriously difficult to actually point to the scientific evidence for that. But what does come to the fore is experience. As I say, we all know it's part of experience. If you follow the Buddha's advice and you meditate for an hour every day for how long, something's going to happen. You know it. Um, so I think it's... In order, this point about authority and legitimacy, it, there's a bit of a clash between those two sides. And I think that's part of our problem. Um, notice the one area that features in both, the spiritual mystical teachings. And I have a sense that actually that is the more important part of what we are about. And just to quote my good friend Jorge Ferrer here, um, Transpersonal psychology must embrace not only a movement away from an overemphasis on inner experience, but also the recovery of a metaphysical import of spiritual knowledge. I think that's a very important statement. And I think that an overemphasis on experience has been problematic, problematic for us. Um, and I do think that the, the particular niche that we occupy transpersonal, as transpersonal psychology that particular niche is a niche in which spiritual mystical teachings are our major resource. And maybe it is the case that the, the transpersonal psychology is more heir to those teachings than maybe scientific psychology. Although that, that's a question that goes back to the roots of psychology and, and, and the methodologies of psychology and the, and the, and the metaphysics of psychology. Uh-huh. I just actually can say a little bit more about science in relation to transformation. Uh, there is increasing scientific work. I alluded to it before. Um, for example, um, uh, the neuroscience looking at, say, mindfulness and these other effects. But it's what I said before, that it's not re- it seems to be outside of transpersonal psychology. Um, it, or, and or it is quite trivial some of the material at the scientific level, looking at the change, the transformations, I think, is relatively trivial compared to what we experience. So, focusing on another key word, which is experimentation, we have 
obviously, and this is straightforward, external experimentation, like, like for example neuroscience or cognitive science on the outside looking in. We have internal experimentation, the Buddhist material is a classic example of that, um, working with different states of the mind and the practices that bring that about. Um, there is a third path to knowledge, which is revelation. And of course that's a very problematic term. You can't you know, stick your head above the parapet and argue, I had a revelation. It goes back to our friend Moses. Uh, so, how do we reconcile this? I would say that, um, just in passing, that transpersonal psychology is the discipline, and maybe the only discipline that explicitly recognises the import of these three paths to knowledge. When I say explicitly, others do implicitly. So, for example, the point about revelation is, I mean, as, as the word revelation sounds highly religious and we can't be having that, but if we talk in Jungian terms, as he put it, that what is meant by revelation is the uncos- unconscious erupting into consciousness, if we put it in that sort of way, then we can start to assimilate it within our discourse. Um, and I would say that there's hardly any branch of science which does not actually have the, the, uh, there's a element of revelation. The aha experience. Something coming from the unconscious. But again, the term revelation takes us back into the spiritual religious. So there's, there's a, a question we've got to look at there. But I think the real the real import of transpersonal psychology comes in terms of our relationship and our understanding of what is not conscious. I discussed this before and written about the the problematic terminology around terms like unconscious, pre-conscious. In a simple way, I think that from a mystical point of view, that which might be called the unconscious, paradoxically, is the richest source of our conscious experiences, I mean mystical experiences. As again, Jung talked about this paradox that the, the way to the greatest light is through the greatest darkness. Very important idea. Um, so here, I, I can flesh this out in terms of these ways to knowledge. Now, so um, the material I looked at in terms of Buddhism, um, the Buddhist looking at the, 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 um, the process of thought and, and, and perception identify many moments of consciousness. That's their terminology. Certainly the Theravadan tradition. So I I would say that in that tradition, there isn't this notion of the unconscious. Rather, there's that of which we may not, in a mundane state, have access. But if you work on yourself, you achieve higher meditative states or whatever, then those seemingly absent parts are there. So they identified moments of consciousness most of which, for a mundane mind, would be what we would call pre-conscious or unconscious. So the internal experimentation comes up with that. External experimentation, so through neuroscience, cognitive science, it, we come up with the term pre-conscious. In other words, when I see something, um, in, in this, the moments before I am conscious of what I'm seeing, all kinds of pre-conscious acti- activity takes place. It's obvious, and I look at, you know, I see my hand, the brain is doing all kinds of things in the moments before I'm conscious. We call those pre-conscious. And from an external experimentation approach, we know a great deal about those stages. And it's very interesting to examine that. But here is the unconscious. And it's what I said before in Jungian terms, the unconscious erupting into consciousness. It's, I think, within the traditions that emphasize revelation that... <coughs> notions that unconscious are born. And when I talk about Kabbalistic psychology, and we'll come to that shortly, uh, it's, it is very interesting. Clearly, Kabbalah is a tradition connected to Revelation because it's sacred scripture is a revealed scripture and uh, its greatest teachers got their teaching, in a sense, from the divine. However, we understand that. Um, it's, so it's interesting that within the Kabbalah, you have ideas about what we would call the unconscious 
way, way back. And, and in fact, I would say that in many ways, the, the practical side of the Kabbalah is very much about making that which was concealed revealed, uncovering the concealed. This notion of covering and uncovering is a, a key concept in Kabbalah. Um, and I wanted just to pursue that another little tangent. How are we doing? How long have I got? No. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, yeah, that's good. That's good. Okay. Um, so, so another little tangent, which is very interesting actually, is uh, thinking about Jung. And obviously Jung is one of the great revered figures, I think, within, you know, probably the most important figure in many ways in transpersonal psychology. Jung's relationship with Judaism and the Kabbalah is a whole topic in its own right. It's a very interesting topic. Um, not, and I talked, actually, when I talked about the Renaissance and the age we're in now, I think this was two years ago at this conference, I was talking about the relation between Freud and Jung and, and looking at that in relation to earlier um, uh, connections in the early Renaissance period. I'm not going to go through that now. Um, Jung had a serious some vision. He was, as we all know, he's very is a visionary. Um, later in his life, he described this vision, um, which was a clearly kind of kabbalistically inspired vision. Uh, so he was in the Pardes Remonim, which means Garden of Pomegranates, but Pardes Remonim, which is Hebrew, is the name of one of the major works of the Kabbalah, and, and Jung would have known that. Um, the Wedding of Teferet and Malkut, which are, again, I'm not going into all the symbolism, but those who've looked into Kabbalah will know those are central terms, and this wedding is the, this, this sacred marriage is the, is the central image within the Kabbalah, so he was obviously connected with that. Or else I was Rabbi Simon Ben Yochai, who's, again, important history around that, etc., etc. I cannot tell you how wonderful it was, I could only think continue, this is the garden of pomegranates, etc., etc. And he described these as the most tremendous and individuating visions of his life. Um, and there seems to be uh, an interesting story here, which I'd say is a bit of a side, side shoot from what I'm talking about centrally, so I'm not going to go into it too much. Um, but j- just in passing, there are two crucial p- points in terms of Jung's life in this context. First is that, that he was very much in favour of national so- socialism. He thought Nazism was a vehicle to bring forward the archetypal world which was very much needed in the 20th century. And I guess with the test of history, he would say he got that wrong. Uh, and he's being accused of a lot of anti-Semitism, which is, again, a whole other subject. Um, so, that, that's one, so there was that kind of background. But the second point is that later, um, when, where, later in his life at the Iranos, um, you know, he had these, these, these seminars, uh, there were some very important scholars of Kabbalah who, who started dialoguing with, with Jung, um, and he seemed to, uh, it seemed that Jung began to appreciate the importance of this material, firstly as, as underpinning a lot of the alchemical work that he'd looked at earlier in his time, and secondly, uh, in relation to Christianity. And again, things I've said on this, you know, in this room before about the importance of looking at the, the, the interrelationships between Judaism and Christianity for our day now, I think it's uh, very important, very close for myself. So Jung had um, come to some kind of rapprochement of course, the other thing in that story would be his split from Freud. We'll leave that for now. Anyway, so this was a very interesting comment um, in an interview. So do you know who anticipated my entire psychology in the 18th century? The Hasidic rabbi Bear from Mezurich, who they called the great maggot. He was a most impressive man. So again, this was after these dialogues that I'm referring to. The maggot of Mezurich, um, Hasidic master, and... Um, he developed a concept of the unconscious in the, in the 18th century and um, had this idea, his, his teachings about that God is the root of thought, but God himself cannot elaborate thought. And it's, the, it's only the human mind that can elaborate thought. And that's why he came to this notion of an unconscious. Unconscious. 
Jung related to that. If you, again, if you read Memories, Dreams, and Reflections, that's very close to what he sees as, as his own myth or the myth for our day. You know, God, in a sense, is unconscious and requires his create, creations to reflect back knowledge. So the great scheme of creation is about the unconscious source being enriched by human consciousness. And that's right at the core of this notion of co-creation, which again I, I mentioned, I asked a question at Ian McGilchrist. Okay, as I say, that was a slight tangent. <laughs> uh, but the tangents are sometimes the best. Uh, so now, so that, okay, that was looking at transpersonal psychology, discipline, where that authority comes. I think what I'm, to put a nutshell there, I would say that, that we have a difficult relationship with science, and I'm not convinced myself that we need to be bedfellows with science. And I think that our strongest relationship is with the spiritual mystical traditions. This has various ontological implications, but I'm not going into that now, but I think we've we talked about that before. So moving to Kabbalistic psychology, and as I say, this is by way of illustrating what I think is um, the role of transpersonal psychology. So uh, there are these two traditions, two great traditions, the Kabbalistic and the, and the psychologist. As they, we could put Buddhism there, we could put Christian mysticism and so on. But let's stick with Kabbalah. Both of them have these... This, twin emphasis. Knowing reality, knowing the mind, and engaging with transformative practices. That's what it's all about. Um, in, uh, obviously, in psychology, the practice is bound up with psychoanalysis, psychotherapy, and so on. In relation to theory, the, the Kabbalah essentially is a science of creation. Now, that's a whole subject in its own right, which I'm not going to go very much into, but probably 90% plus of Kabbalistic texts are about the nature of creation. And you might say, well, you know, that's all about God and crazy things, you know, in the beginning God created whatever, whatever, whatever. But actually, the whole study of the science of creation is the study of the nature of mind. We'll touch on that a bit more as we go on. Um, obviously, from the psychological point of view, it's a science of mind. Um, and the way that the Kabbalah gets there is through revelation and exegetical you know, working with the revealed tradition, obviously science and inductive methods. As far as practice is concerned, the, I think the, the therapeutic is straightforward. We're looking at transformation of self. The Kabbalistic is very interesting because there's not so much self-oriented, not overtly. The goal of the Kabbalah, or the goal of the Kabbalist, is to transform the Godhead. And this goes back to what I said about the, the uh, co-creating. It's a very bold statement. In fact, so it's very interesting, uh, written in that area, and uh, I can talk to people more about that. Um, of course, self-transformation comes into that. You're not going to do much for him up there if you haven't sorted yourself out, to put it slightly naively. So these, these two relate. Transformation of self, transformation of the Godhead, um, and, and the methods, as I just indicated. So th it's this whole area that I call Kabbalistic psychology. It's, as I say, there's a coming together, one can inform the other. And obviously that's what my work is really concerned with. Um, so now, so moving into the, well, we've already moved into the third part of the sandwich. I hope you like the filling. But the, the bread's okay. Bread's all right as well. <laughs> so, what, so, Kabbalistic psychology, just like we might talk about Buddhist, Buddhist psychology, Vedic psychology, is about looking at those ideas, teachings, which relate to the questions that we as psychologists are interested in. And I would say that these devolve into two areas. And it's no accident that I called them easy and hard. If anyone has looked in the area of consciousness studies, you'll know that a very a seminal input came from David Chalmers, who, who said, basically, there are easy 
excuse me, there are easy aspects of the questions we might ask about consciousness, and there are hard ones. And what he meant by that, the easy ones are not that easy. But the hard it, it involves ontological issues, what we call the explanatory gap. I mean, basically, you know, if you think it's all to do with the brain, when how the hell can all this physical grey matter bring about the richness of experience? We've got no idea to this day. We've got no idea uh, how they can happen. I think, I mean, obviously the question itself may be wrong because it may not be a product of this, but that's uh, another story itself. Um, so those, those, that's the hard problem. The easy questions are, um, if you, you know, within neuroscience or cognitive science, to understand things like you know, pre-conscious and conscious processes. Um, take something, a syndrome like blind sight or amnesia, where there are, we can point to good scientific evidence looking at what's going on in relation to the conscious and unconscious processes involved. Those are the kind of easy aspects. They're not easy, but philosophically they're easier. We have the same thing in relation to Kabbalistic psychology. And that's no accident, because, of course, it's the same area. <laughs> so um, if I identify the easier areas... And I'll talk about these, given time, we'll look at them. Um, the, the essential point about these er easy areas is that there are no unmeasurable variables and there's no ontological challenge to physicalism. So, for example, and I say we can perhaps talk about these more, um, uh, and I've got some slides which will flesh these out, so we'll come to them. But just, for, just in passing, there are concepts in the Kabbalah, again going back quite early, um, of limited and expanded consciousness. You don't need to challenge the ontological, bring in the ontological issue to understand that. I mean, it may be phrased in Kabbalistic literature in terms of prophetic states, connection with the divine. But fair enough, but we don't need that ontological material. We can understand limited and expanded consciousness in ways that are not really problematic for psychology. And so with, with these other areas, which I'll, I'll come back to these. But the hard areas are teachings about different worlds. So Kabbalah, like many other spiritual traditions, considers that there are different worlds. That David was earlier referring to Maya. This world is illusion. There are different levels. There, in Kabbalah, there are four worlds, um, each with its different characteristic. Um, and this central notion, as I put it here, interactive, interactivity above and below. The, the, the key concept of the human created in the image of the divine is this notion that, that the human spans, as we said before, as above, so below. And human consciousness is the vehicle for that reflectivity, which goes back to what we saw with that reflectivity with the great name of the divine. Um, you're not going to be able to look at that in terms of scientific psychology. Well, well actually, maybe. Maybe we'll come to that. <laughs> so a correspondence above and below. Again, a challenging, a hard concept. So for a Kabbalistic psychology might focus on these kind of areas. I'm not saying these are exhaustive. They're areas that we can get our teeth into, that we can build psychological models to relate to. Well, they're areas that we can think about in terms of psychological practice, working on oneself, expanding one's consciousness, etc. Let's have a quick look at some of those. I've, I've lost track. I don't even know what time we're meant to go to, but just tell me. Yeah, fine. Okay. So, so I alluded to this. Isaac the Blind is on the 12th century. He's often considered as one of the primary figures in the rise of what became known as Kabbalah in the 12th, 13th century. Very, very interesting character. The prophets saw the attributes in accord with their comprehension and by means of receiving their potencies, they would expand their minds more than other human beings. There's a lot in this. I'm not unpacking what he means by potencies and so on. There's a lot in what he's saying there. But just this idea of expanding the mind is, is what I'm referring to in that context. Um, Okay, another of these easy concepts is to do with the unconscious roots of thought. And I've already alluded to that in some detail, um, um, that, that the Kabbalah is centrally concerned with the fact that the 
thought is initially concealed, i.e. unconscious, and there are stages through which the, the concealment is revealed, i.e. it becomes conscious, and actually then also goes back to the unconscious state. So this, 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 some of these uh, quotes become quite um, esoteric. So this is about the nature of creation, and, and for the Kabbalist, creation is a product of thought, divine thought. But ultimately, there's a continuity, or maybe contiguity, between divine thought and human thought. There's an isomorphism. So whatever's been saying about the mind of God is implicitly a statement about the human mind. That's the central Kabbalistic concept. So from with the, with the, the concealed of the concealed, the beginning of the descent of the infinite divine essence, there's a faint light which is unknowable, concealed in recesses like the point of beautiful poetry. Beautiful poetry. It is the mystery of the concealment of thought. Etc. So there's a lot of material about that, and uh, it's no accident, actually, I'd, this is another tangent, <laughs> but uh, you know, the, the, the inverted commas, discovery of the unconscious, I very much put inverted commas there, I think it's no accident that a lot of the figures in the discovery of the unconscious were, were, were Jewish, and often informed by the Jewish tradition. Uh, that's a whole subject, as I say, a slightly separate subject. But it is interesting to see the, the, the role, and, and, and scholars have looked at this, the, 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 the role, as it were, of unconsciousness as portrayed in Kabbalah in relation to psychoanalysis and other, and the, other movements. The other area I'm very interested in um, it moves more into practice, although, again, there's only this permeable division between what's theory and practice. Um, so key Kabbalistic practices involve a sort of spiritualized association. Okay, it's, no, it's, it's, it's no accident that, that Freud used free association. Kabbalistic practices use disciplined association, very much using, for example, divine names and working with the Hebrew, and it's a very complex language and one thing and another. And I could spend a lot of time talking about this, so I'm going to keep, try and keep this quite short, just to give the indications. All I want to indicate is the way in which there is a whole psychology here. That's what I mean, again, about Kabbalistic psychology. Kabbalah can inform psychology, psychology can inform Kabbalah. Um, so in the understanding of creation, it is understood that God used these letters, the Hebrew letters, and this describes uh, he had them in a wheel and the wheels rotating back and forth. It's association. A bit like in a modern, I think, metaphor would be the gene pool. Yeah? Male and female come together and there are different aspects of the coding and, it, and, and whatever comes out from that coding, that is what is produced. So this is a sort of pre, pre-genetics version. 231 gates are the number of combinations between um, two letter combinations within the set. You're, you're a mathematician. The set of 22 letters. Right? Correct? 231. Absolutely right? <laughs> I was relying on you to come. I'll leave that because we're going to have time. Well, just th- this again, very, very complex. Um, I've written about this, so you know, if you want to read it, you can. I can point you in the direction. But I just want to uh, quickly say this question, what is a word? It's a very, very interesting question. It would take me half an hour to unpack this particular statement with its references to biblical exegesis and so on. Let's just hold on to that idea. What is a word? And the answer comes with a, pe- a play of language from somewhere else, um, a word fitly spoken, Proverbs. The play is the, the, the Hebrew word meaning fitly, which is ofnav, is essentially the same as another word, which means its wheel, ofnav. That's, you've got to get into the Hebrew for that, of course, so I can't say much more. Look, something very profound is being said there. The wheel is about associations. In other words, what is a word? A word is not just that particular thing, chair. No. When I say the word chair, automatically you have all kinds of associations. You have an image, you, you know it's something for sitting on. That's the whole repertoire of that. So associationism is at the core of the psychological process. And that's what they're bringing out here. This whole process of exegesis and interpretation is all about playing with language. And it goes into the more mystical area with these arcane practices. 
um, which were d- written down in the, the, the thir- mainly the 13th century. Um, you got to combine letters, you get in different state, revolve the languages, begin by comparing this name, which is the name of God, the sacred tetragrammaton, and then look at its combinations and turn it about like a wheel returning around, front and like a scroll, the rolling around of your thoughts. This is a description of what, for example, Freud was doing. Not in sacred terms. But Freud was saying, well, okay, lie down on this couch. What's going around in your mind? You had a dream? What do you connect to that? What does it, you, you dreamt that you saw a chair? What does a chair mean to you? Was it a particular chair? Did you fall off it? So there's clearly a connection there. And um, I, again, we won't have time to go into this in detail, but um, these practices... We can analyse what's going on. Um, firstly, there's, I, I don't know if anyone knows, the work goes long back now, Julian Jaynes, the bicameral mind. He, uh, I, there's a lot to say on that as well, but one of the pru- crucial bits he talks about, I think he gets a number of things wrong, but one thing that I think is right is when he talks about throwbacks to this early stage of organisation of the brain. Vestiges of the bicameral mind, he calls it. And one of the things he, he says is really crucial for the, this, this changed state, this altered state, is archaic authorization. And that's clearly here within this tradition. The, he, these people are playing with the Hebrew language, and the Hebrew letters are totally sacred for them. These are the letters with which God created everything. These are sacred, divine, etc. So clearly that is at the root. Like, you know, in a hypnotic state, there has to be some sort of uh, belief of the authority of what's going on. Um, And then when uh, these people describe the practice, there's all kinds of surrounding activity. They they fast, you have to be solitude, um, you you light lots of candles, and there's movement and visualization. All these things we can look at psychologically in terms of altered states. So they might be described in Kabbalistic literature in kind of theological terms, but it goes back to what I was saying about these are easy concepts. We know about trance states. We know what's happening in different regions of the brain, that kind of thing. Um, Interesting in these particular processes, they're language-specific. And that's a whole subject about the role of language psychologically and mystically in the Kabbalah. Um, As I said earlier... Kabbalah is really very centrally about the nature of language. Um, and there's a kind of deconstruction of meaning and reconstruction, and the point psychologically is that language is not just a means of communication. It's fairly obvious. So language is very much about the nature of self, the construction of our, our world. So if you're involved in a practice which starts deconstructing that, then it makes sense that this is a very, um, very psychologically active kind of practice. So again, in terms of psych- Kabbalistic psychology, uh, this is an interesting area itself, but I just think I'll leave it and skirt over it, just to say in passing, these are very embodied practices. The mystics are I- I- in touch with their own bodies. It's very interesting because um, the Jewish tradition, like the Christian tradition, whatever, that, you know, often is thought in terms of ascent, you know, reaching higher levels and all that, which of course it is. But it doesn't mean that that doesn't have to be embodiment. In fact, uh, the Washburn discussion might come into this, but we'll, we'll leave that for a moment. Um, the, and this comes out in a whole area, the Golem tradition. Uh, we'll leave that for now. Okay. So, consciousness and mystical practice, this, uh, this relates to a whole model of the mind that, that people who've read my work will, will, will understand. Um, I'm sorry that I haven't got time to explain it fully, but I just want to make a simple point, I think it's very simple, is that the memory structure is where all these associations are that I was referring to. They're, they're obviously structures in memory, that's very clear. Whatever memory is, whether it's in the brain or not in the brain, we don't have to go into that. Um, and when I'm... My, my normal mundane consciousness concerns the output of those processes. And actually there's a sort of sense in which the ego is constructed. It's an interpretation of that whole other subject as well. So that's the sort of basic model. What's going on with these practices is that the, the, the leading edge is being shifted backwards into what we might call pre-conscious or unconscious states. 
and this fleshes out the way that's happening. So essentially, it, given that there's these two different processes going on, you can move things in that direction either by increasing here, which actually would be um, what was it? prophetic mysticism. There's these two branches of mysticism. Apophatic is sort of turning down the sense of ego. Propo- cataphatic. Cataphatic is sort of turning up here. So it's no accident there is these two aspects of mysticism. I would say Kabbalah is more on the cataphatic stage. Although the language practices that I was talking about before, uh, there's the wheel of words and letters which I referred to. <laughs> um, so Abulafia, who's a very interesting mystic from that 13th century period who, who wrote down a lot of these practices, you can analyze, I mean, again, we don't really have time, but you can analyze things he's saying and you can sort of see where they are. You can map them onto this model. So he says um, he's got to untie the knots from himself. In fact, schematic, you know, in modern psychology we talk about schemata. The schematic structures, you've got to break through them. So that's about shifting away from habitual conscious operation. He talks about, um, he's got to strengthen his seclusion, which is, of course, turning down the normal hubbub of the mind. Then he's got to do this cataphatic process, combining the name, which we saw before. So again, you, you know, we can map these in psychological terms. Okay. Now, that's all the easy concepts. What about the hard concepts? Well, actually, probably I'm running out of time. All right, because I was hoping I might run out of time, then I didn't have to deal with the hard bit. <laughs> okay, the hard material, like I said before, is about, is, is, is about as I call it there, patterns within patterns. Um, uh, when God made the world, he made this world and the world above. All were created in one moment. There are different worlds. And Adam, i.e. the human archetype, was an entity prepared in his pattern to correspond to what is above. Again, I can point to many textual allusions that are central to the Kabbalistic worldview. I think that this idea of the macrocosm and microcosm is a concept that we need to bring into transpersonal psychology. It's challenging because of the hard aspect, the ontological issues. But I do think that, that crucial areas of the esoteric and mystical traditions are founded on those ideas. And maybe, you know, if we, the danger is if, if we don't embrace them, the baby's going out with the bathwater. So the question is, how do we relate to those in ways that don't completely embarrass us? Um, the, the, um, there, is a, there is a model um, in, in Kabbalah about the way in which the above and the below interrelate. Uh, so the Zohar is a central text of Kabbalah. It's a big work, many volumes. Um, it's central myth. And when I say myth, I don't mean illusion, obviously. I'm sure everyone knows what I mean by myth. Its central myth is this idea. We produce an impulse from below. In other, nothing's going to happen unless we start the process. So we produce that impulse. And, if, and then by that impulse from below, uh, there's higher impulses going up. And then there is awakened a yet higher impulse. The impulse reaches the place where the lamp is to be lit. Now, that's obviously a codified expression. It's talking about the downward influx from the, from the higher world, the influx which would identify the consciousness or the, or the divine presence. So by our, by, it, it goes back to the divine, divine name with the arrows there, Right? By what, you know, in terms of what we do here, through meditation, prayer, different activity, right activity, in inverted commas, we stimulate something above, and that which is above comes back down. And I thought about that a great deal, and um, I think that, actually, this is just another example, uh, which maybe is more immediately relevant to transversal psychology. Let's just have a quick look at this. Human thought has the ability to strip itself and to ascend to the place of its thoughts. That's a very transpersonal statement, I think. That's a very interesting statement. Uh, it unites with the supernal entity from where it came, and they become one, and then it returns from above to below, um, and then the brilliant light comes, and you know, it's a mystical experience. It's describing a mystical experience. 
Um, so this interrelationship, this reflexivity that I referred to right at the beginning, and you find that reflectivity in microcosmic form in the neuroscientific understanding of consciousness. Now, this is where I go beyond the bounds. I mean, this is where I embarrass myself. Because, of course, it's, this is not solid evidence. But there's no doubt that modern research into consciousness... Okay, so recurrent or re-entrant processing, which means the activity in higher centres of the brain coming back down to the lower centres... I haven't got time to go into that, but take it from me, that's from above to below in those microcosmic terms of the brain. There is very, very good evidence, uh, I think incontrovertible evidence, that that's central to consciousness. And this quote here, that such activity that above to below is the key neural ingredient of consciousness. We could even define consciousness as recurrent processing from above to below. So there is an interesting parallel here. When we're studying the brain to find its connection with consciousness, and just in parenthesis, I don't think that the brain is all there is to say about consciousness, but that's another story. Um, But when we're looking at the brain to see how it does relate to consciousness, the evidence suggests that it's to do with this downward limb processing. So there is a parallel. So that just makes that point quickly. I'll go through this quickly because I think we're coming out of time. But that's the the, the lower area and the higher area and... Uh, what we call feed forward and recurrent and the relationship between them and the point I just made that consciousness is particularly related to that downward limb. Very interesting. Takes us back to this diagram. It is the same point. It is this reflectivity in microcosmic form. I can't say that's definitive evidence, but I think it's interesting suggestion about the parallel. And that idea of parallel is itself Kabbalistic. Interesting. Um, so we end up with this, this diagram, which uh, th- this is what we know about from, from neuroscience. There's an input from the world, lower processing, high processing areas. What we don't know from neuroscience, of course, there are, there are higher levels, ontologically separate la- levels. The Kabbalists talked about the active intellect, which is an Aristotelian term. We could say collective unconscious, for example, or, or higher mind, higher self. Um, and from that quote from the Zohar, you know, there is the source of blessing. The lamp is lit, which I would see as being consciousness. Uh, and, and so that's, that's the model. That's a model that works with Kabbalah. Um, and here, the same model works with the neuroscience of consciousness. It's just, of course, that it's got, neuroscience can't have any connection with that. So there's a, a, a way in, I think to think about the hard. So, in a nutshell, and I'll finish with this, right? Um, you know, I would stake, <laughs> I, would, I would lay my head on the block where it comes to the easy concepts. There is a clear parallel, a clear way, a path, a, an academic discipline even, where we can look at what these ancient texts, whatever, are saying. We can look at that in psychological terms. And maybe there's a feedback there as well um, so you know hopefully no one would cut my head off on that uh, this later material well I wouldn't put a head on the book <laughs> but I think this is where our work really lies thank you have we got it oh. Thank you so much, Les. It's an absolutely wonderful talk. Uh, it struck me at the end, though, what a precious resource you are. You're someone who can move with such authority between things such as cognitive neuroscience, psychology, and uh, the Kabbalah, and show authority in all those areas. And it, it is so easy to do facile comparisons between things like this. You do need to have depth in each of these different areas to be able to make useful, build useful bridges between them. And you're one of the very few who can do that. So we must make sure you're protected and <laughs> preserved. <laughs> um, you mean pickled? At the end, we've picked you as well, like Jeremy Bentham. We'll put you. We'll bring you to the conference in a pickled form, as he's in University uh, uh, College Great. London. Great. Um, but going from that surrealistic image of a pickled Les, it gets pickled in another way tonight when you relax with a, with some wine. Would people like to ask some questions of Les?
Oh, we've been uh, over, overawed by his... Uh, uh. Point 11. I can't believe I did. Um, there was um, um, one of the texts you used that, said, that mentioned patterns within patterns. Is this where Kabbalah meets um, mathematical fractals and physical hologram? hologram? What an interesting question. And I would say yes. It's a very astute observation. Again, it's, 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 it's difficult to summarize, but uh, Kabbalah is a very, you know, there's an esoteric science connected with, with Sufism and, and, and the sort of going back into Pythagorean. You know, the roots of these things are in mystery. We don't really know. There's clearly a kind of mathematical dimension. Um, you know, looking at the numerical relationships in the revealed scriptural text is very much at the core of Kabbalah. And, um, and it's a very interesting area. So the, the mathematics, or, or, or you know, number, um, is central. Um, and what you're saying about fractals, yes. I mean, you know, the pattern is within a pattern, and, and it continues. Uh, thanks for that, Les. Um, it was a very quick question. Um, I'm just wondering, I noticed the word Aleph in there, and I was just wondering about its meaning. Right. Uh, because it has an, another couple of very interesting meanings, and I'm just wondering, because it's clearly uh, a, a Yiddish word. And I, so, uh, I can't remember. Yeah, so, uh, so Aleph is the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Um, I mean, it does have a meaning, um, it's, I mean, in English, we get maybe the word aloof comes from aleph. It's quite interesting. And, and the, the aleph is, in a sense, aloof from the rest of the letters. Um, but it's meaning, I, I think I, allude, I put it on that slide with the name of God. Um, the shape of the letter, which oh, I'll just take it from me, the shape of the letter involves that reflexivity. So, in, in, in the, the very beginning, that, that, that sort of glyph of reflexivity is, is hinted at in the alphabet. Aleph is a silent letter. It has no sound of its own. And it alludes to the transcendent. And so a lot of Kabbalistic material goes into the symbolism of the letters in that way. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any more questions? Oh, thank you. Well, all it remain... Sorry. Yes. Um, Is the I also number one? The one? I? I. You mean the as one. in me? The number one. The one. I'm not sure exactly. I mean, the, the Aleph we could take as referring to the, the essence of the divine, which is the ultimate one. On your I first uh, slide, it's, it's at the end. I am the one. I'm sorry. It is I. It is I. Well done. It is I. Here I am. Here I am. Here I am, yes. Or here am I. Yes, well the word... In is that the one? So the I is transcribed, can also be transcribed. As the okay, so the, so the word in Hebrew meaning I, or ego, or, you know, the first person... Begins with the letter Aleph, which is the first letter, and uh, the mystics do allude to the importance of that. Um, and uh, in addition, the the word again meaning I is an anagram of a word meaning nothing. Nothing. So in in, in I think that's what you alluded to, right? That's so in the if I transliterate, mm -hmm. the Hebrew is ani, so a n i, right? That means I. A i n just switching the positions, uh, means nothingness. So, there's, you know, the mystics make it, they have a field day with that, you can imagine, right? I mean, essentially, I is nothing. And the mystic path is, is, is about realising that nothingness. I get that. Yeah. I'm constantly amazed by every single question that comes up. You're able to bring such wisdom and erudition to it. And... Uh, all it remains for me to do is to thank you very much, Les, for an absolutely wonderful talk. Thank you very much. Thank you.